So hi, everybody, and welcome to this session. I'm going to open a very, very short presentation, very, very short, to introduce the, the, the session. One second. This. So today, we have a best practice session, session two, and we have four speakers. Okay, for presentations. And first is going to be Inma, so be that scroll. I'm going to present her in a minute. Then John Antil in this order. Then Washington Luis Ribeiro de Carvalho. I don't know how to say your name, it's too long. And then Isabel Martin Tirado, okay, in the, in the fourth place. So I'm going to put it better. So in principle, you have 10 minutes to talk, okay, the presentation. Some of you have expressed the intention to talk longer, but uh, it's fine. We have enough time to talk 10 minutes or 20 minutes. And then uh, even though I'm going to, to say you five minutes or two minutes or whatever, and then we will have five minutes of questions and answers. Uh, in principle, after each presentation, if not, please, Thomas or whatever, please uh, correct me after each presentation, okay? You can use the, the chat in order to um, put your questions or suggestions or raise your hand if you want to talk or whatever. So if you want, we can start with Inma, are you ready? Yes. Okay. So a very short introduction. She's a senior information manager officer at FAO in the United, United Nations. And she's leading very important projects, Agrobook, Agris, and Agora, or programs more than projects. And the, the talk of today is about promoting accessibility of scientific information and dig digital data in food and agriculture. So she's going to talk and present everything. It's your turn. I'm going to sh shut up. Thank you, Gemma. I'm um, going to leave the, the screen. Yeah. OK. So thank you, Gemma. And thank you as well to BCMI for having invited me today. I'm going to speak about one of these programs that Gemma was mentioning, which is Agrims and uh, focusing on how we are populating the database and also how we are encouraging data providers to participate in this, um, in this initiative. Um, yes, first of all, let me introduce a little bit more. My organization is the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, is a specialized agency of the United Nations that leads international efforts to defeat hunger. This is, uh, in order to achieve this, FAO established a series of knowledge programs uh, to help to increase the accessibility and visibility of research products in its member countries and to make information available, accessible and usable worldwide. Uh, this exchange of knowledge not, is not only because FAO wants to achieve world free of hunger, malnutrition and poverty, but it's also part, an important part of anything that has to do with the achievement of SDGs. In this context, AGRIS is placed, and AGRIS is what is called the International Information System for, uh, for Agricultural Sciences and Technology. Essentially, uh, we collect bibliographic information from around the world on scientific, technical, and socioeconomic publications in a very wide variety of topics related to the FAO's areas of interest and it's operational since 1975. So it's uh, quite uh, well established and well known in our sector program. Um, program. It's important to remark uh, that we have two different elements in Agris that have been um, rebound uh, in a way during the last uh, two years. One is the Agris, Net the Agris Network, which is a community of organizations who collect and contribute 
information about food and agricultural literature, and also they are as part of a community of practice participating in the knowledge sharing activities. You can have uh, you can look for more information at um, at this website, uh, father.org slash agris. But then as a result of the Agris network, what we have is what is called the Agris database. Currently, we have more than 13.5 uh, million structured bibliographical records in, um, in 90 languages. As I will show you later, multilinguality is, is one of the main uh, concerns in all our programs, but particularly for Agris. And this is the other website that you can visit, agrisatfa.org, to look for more information about the database. Essentially, the functions that were, um, let's say, uh, defined for Agris is to create a single comprehensive database of worldwide agricultural literature uh, to meet also information needs by providing online retrieval mechanisms. And when uh, necessary, because we don't host full text, we only have uh, metadata in our repository, but to support the organizations, the individuals that are asking for uh, full text that is not available uh, through links um, in Agris. And also what we are doing is to interact with other search engines to increase search efficiency, and hence visibility and accessibility of agricultural scientific research. We have been working with Google Scholar now for more than a decade, I think it's about 10, day, 10 years, and, and the collaboration actually, as an example, uh, works very well, but we are also collaborating with other search engines. Let's talk about the Agris network, which is new. I uh, think that we never presented this in, in the CMI before as such. So um, we can have this database so populated, as I mentioned before, because people are coming to us, organizations are coming to us and are sharing their bibliographic references. Uh, so we have a real um, dependency of our member countries, the organizations related to our member countries to submit these contributions. And also uh, to strengthen the multilingualism and equitable representation. Agris network itself is a key element that uh, ensures um, Agris as a database and provides the diversity that we are looking for. We have Moldova submitting metadata, Indonesia, and also very small countries that perhaps what they are producing per year is very low, is very small, the quantity is small, but relevant for us because it's what they are producing there. So in this case, um, this um, diversity is really look uh, one of the, the main um, objectives that we have through the Agris network. At the moment, uh, we have about 454 data providers. I must say that we are rebumping because we had many more in the past, but we are now making them active again. So a big percentage of this number are active um, data providers. And we have 16 pending applications. This is more or less what we receive per week. So we receive quite a lot of uh, um, um, uh, requests to participate in Agris. And this is the map. Uh, that helps you to, uh, um, to imagine a little bit the representation of Agris worldwide. Yep. Uh, so in a nutshell, this, this network uh, is composed of two elements. One is the data provider itself, which is contributing. And then we have what we, we call the country hubs, which are the focal points for Agris at country le level and also regional. And they are um, let's say also providing uh, capacity development uh, support to those organizations that they don't know much about metadata, they don't know how to generate the metadata, et cetera, et cetera. And perhaps they are not even in, talking English in these organizations, but then they want to be part of an international community. So how they can come, how they can become a data provider so essentially, um, um, they have to have um, a collection of scientific literature, either through digital libraries, repositories, or journals, and then they can simply apply for registration. They don't have to be necessarily online in a way. Uh, we have many data providers that are generating metadata through Zotero, and they are submitting the metadata to us because it's the only way that they have to really be present on the web. So we are kind of... Uh, 
search areas is a search engine, but at the same time, it's also data provider itself in a way. They simply have to provide some information. We verify this information. We have received quite a lot of requests from um, um, organizations or even publishers that actually are particularly publishers, predatory, they have predatory journals, et cetera. There is quite a lot of quality control in that sense. And you can also search all the data providers that we have on in Agris through this um, URL that is displayed here. Why is it so important for us to have a registry? Uh, because we are, um, we are, we don't have only the providers submitting data. As I said, the Agris network aims to really make possible that these organizations can say to their, so let's say these libraries can say to their managers, we are uh, generating metadata and we are submitting this metadata to Agris, but we are gaining as well as an institution, a lot of visibility. And this is the reason why we have what is called the data providers profile uh, under the file.org slash Agris website. And then depending on uh, what they are generating in the context of Agris, the Agris network, we are embedding and we are creating through open link, um, open link, um, link open data principles, the generation of this, this way to uh, create a more, let's say, um, dynam dynamized um, profiles that help to them also to say to the public, to the in general, to any user what they are doing and what is what they are um, publishing in their organizations. Um, it's also possible to see the status. And uh, in this case, for instance, the Informi is active. You can also look for it from the agris.file.org. Um, uh, so there is a linkage between the registry and uh, the website, the database. And uh, the, the, origin, the idea is always, as I said, uh, provide um, much, uh, maximum visibility as possible. Here is a way that we are showing also these uh, data providers. They take um, ownership of all the metadata they are submitting. So for instance, in this case is the National Academy of Sciences of Belarus. Uh, it's explicitly said in the page of um, the record uh, that they are the data provider. And if you want to have more information about it, you can contact them. We are simply facilitators. We are simply facilitators in all these, uh, uh, let's say ecosystem that is uh, what is being generated in the, um, in the scientific framework in food and agriculture. But we are, yeah. So these are our last changes that we have done recently and actually they are becoming very popular. Uh, the content, the strategy uh, with regards to the content changed mm, dramatically during the last years. We are moving from unique repositories to a range of types of information resources. We also are now uh, ingesting data sets. We are focusing very much on quality. We are not really looking for getting a lot, but what we get should be pertinent and should be in the scope of Agris. We are collaborating with data providers. Uh, so um, they are our primary sources. We are creating a lot of um, um, knowledge building in these organizations, and we are doing a lot of capacity, as I mentioned before, to help them to understand what are the principles behind um, metadata standards, et cetera, uh, currently in the market. And, um, and this is one of the reasons why we could also engage so much with them. And we are also populating areas more than expected. We also encourage that they set media graphic records with links to the full text. And we have different types of resources, a part of data sets, the traditional ones with our journal articles, monographs, books, book chapters, conference proceedings, papers, gray literature, and data sets. Multilinguality is a must in FAO. So we have a large number of languages represented in Agris. And actually, just um, to mention that recently we have been cleaning up all our XML repository, and now we are uh, trying to map different codes for language. Um, and we have decided to use only one, but we are mapping two different to um, make sure that when people are ingesting metadata in Agris is a standardized in the way that Agris would like to see these languages in, in the system. This is something that 
is going to be online very soon. Um, Agrivoc is helping a lot in order to achieve uh, also the retrieval of this multilinguality. Agrivoc is the multilingual thesaurus um, that is also sitting in our team, uh, has been out there as well for quite a while, and essentially is translated uh, into 41 languages. And this is what we are using actually to, um, to, you, to help agrivocs to discover the content in different uh, languages. Um, yes, uh, Agrivoc is very big. So that is the reason why uh, we also, um, yeah, we can really um, use it so much in our system due to the variety of uh, records we have. Um, we have about uh, 39,000 uh, concepts. This is, there is a small mistake there. We have since I think this week, 41 languages. And uh, yes, so um, essentially we couldn't, I think, run Agris without having a thesaurus with these particularities uh, behind uh, the system. This is an example of how we are visualizing the Agrivoc keywords. You can browse the systems using Agrivoc and you can also retrieve content, as I mentioned before, uh, through the Agrivoc keywords translated. Not all the concepts in Agrivoc are translated, this is a limitation, but we are working very hard now to get at least the six official languages in FAO. Um, yeah, this is also something pretty new. Um, we have diversified the way that people can submit the metadata to Agris. Uh, we are um, updating Agris monthly, while um, we are also harvesting metadata um, um, every quarterly. But essentially, data providers can submit metadata using simply an email. They can also uh, use the automatic data upload, ADU, that I'm going to explain right now. And we are using as well OAI PMH endpoints. Metadata quality is a requirement. We are using um, uh, principles that were developed uh, together with Matcha Zeng some years ago, and last year was um, updated, which is the Link Open Data Enabled Bibliographic Data, LODDD 3.0. And uh, you can see in the table the specifications about uh, what they can submit, how they have to submit it. But this doesn't imply anything about the metadata format. So we care about the contents, but the metadata format, they can submit metadata in different formats. There is no distinction for us. They can use Crossref, they are, can use DOJ, Agris IP, which is the standard in FAO, EndNode, Mods, Dublin Core, PubMed. Do we don't care. The problem is that needs to be well formatted. What is important for us is to work on the metadata quality. And as many of you, if no, it's, this is the big challenge. Um, not always is um, as good as we would like to, and this is what is creating some um, issues to the, um, the search engines. Um, in order to attract more um, data providers, we also develop what is called the institutional dashboard. So we said, well, they are doing a lot of work. They are submitting metadata to us, but how can we really encourage them uh, or to tell them how good this is in a way or another. So how can we really uh, go back to the data providers with services that can help them to sell the work that they are doing even in their own organizations? A part of the automatic data upload, ADU, that I'm going to explain right now, uh, you, they can also look at the logs historically, they uh, submit through the ADU, they can access um, institutional usage statistics, which is essentially page views, um, country visits by, uh, by year. They can see the most visited 15 records and they can browse and search institutional collections together to filter by country and data providers. This is growing. We are also working on demand. Uh, so we are listening very carefully all our data providers um, um, and, and, and understanding a little bit better what is what they need. And uh, this is the automatic data upload ADU is uh, a, a piece of software that is allowing us uh, to provide a way to the data provider that they submit, they submit data directly into the dashboard and um, they don't have to use the email anymore. 
This means that this application has to be standard, has to be standard to all the metadata formats I was explaining before. And um, the user, the, the organization, the data provider has to specify very clearly what is the, um, the metadata format that is going to submit every month because we have uh, organizations that are submitting them uh, this metadata every month. It's very popular. Now we are fully implemented it and it's helping them also to, to see to trace the locks of their submissions, which is very important because otherwise they were very much dependent on us. We have implemented as well the data harvesting, and this is very recent as well. Um, so we wanted to automatize the process of data ingestion, looking at um, um, uh, data providers that had OAIP image implemented. And uh, this was uh, got operational in May, 2021. We have so far uh, more than 1 million new records. And there was a, there's quite a lot of work in ch checking the, um, the situation of these endpoints and the records that we can um, harvest. And there is a lot of pre-work, but then it's worse because then is when we can reach a big um, collections uh, pretty, uh, pretty fast. Um, and I think that this is probably my last slide. Uh, we have been receiving a lot of um, requests from organizations, uh, publishers, uh, other search engines asking for all agris because in the past was um, open and available. However, uh, we received um, the complaints from our network because many of them, they didn't want to share the metadata. So what we decided to do was to create the Agri's Open Dataset, uh, which is CC BY 3.0, and then uh, it's, it's available in Agri's AP and RDA formats. Um, so essentially here we have um, metadata from the, the organizations that they agree in getting their own metadata available um, as an open data set. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's produced every month as in the same way that the agris.file.org is being um, updated and it's, it's quite used. Um, so with this, what we want to assure is that our uh, data providers can have even more visibility of what they are publishing in their organizations. So what is what we are thinking about uh, implementing uh, um, very soon, actually it's going to be next year, beginning of next year. We want to improve the search uh, functionalities and also the user experience. At the moment, this um, interface we have is pretty old and we didn't want to work on this particular interface without really cleaning up the backend. Um, um, and also to sorting out the Agris network. Now that this is, this is sorted out, we are going to start improving and probably changing completely the, the search um, interface plus the functionalities. We are also, as I mentioned before, we are really cleaning up our XML repository, which is not easy considering that we have um, metadata from the 70s. Um, so uh, now we have started with language, it's over. Um, then we are going to start with the uh, dates, which is really a challenge. And then we are going to continue with type of documents, et cetera, et cetera, until we don't have um, all the repository in a good shape. We are also looking for better usability, as I said before. We want to increase the visibility of the Agris data providers, and this we are working very hard to do so. And actually, the, the statistics have increased so pretty, pretty much um, from 2020 to 2021. We got 20% more users uh, visits um, uh, on our Agris website than in yeah, in the past um, past year, and we also want to better connect with Agrivoc. And this is something that definitely we are planning to do. And uh, I hope that we are going to uh, have good results the next year. And as usual, we continue to carefully listen the demands from the Agris network organizations uh, or any, any, um, yes, any, any um, individual as well that uh, wants to um, mention something or wants to recommend something to improve in Agris. This is the team. It's a very, very small team. 
um, but uh, they are doing a great job. Um, uh, they have been working very hard during the COVID and this is the reason as well why we have such amount of things uh, in a good shape right now. And um, if you want to contact for more information, please do so, agris at FAO.org. And you can also follow our, us at uh, FAO Aims um, and um, Twitter, uh, our Twitter account. Thank you. So thank you very much, Imma. I think it has been very, very clear and interesting. I haven't seen any questions from the audience, but if you want to do it now, people, we have like 19 attendees, more panelists. So people, if you want. If not, I would like to ask you about uh, this thing you put in one of the last sentences, in the one last slides about the usability. Are you doing a specific uh, study or what are you yeah. doing? With yeah, we are, we, are, we are working on that now. We are going to do first, uh, we are going to send a survey because we want to understand what functionalities we have on the on our website that are useful for our users, and then we want to make um, uh, an analysis about the user experience. This was supposed to be done last year, but as I said before, uh, we decided to do it in the other way around to leave this at the end because then we can. And the important for us is the metadata that we have in our XML repository. So now that we understand how we are going to improve that, then is when we can work on this. But uh, yes, um, survey, and then we are going to do from that on um, an analysis of uh, this user experience. Okay. And about the search functionalities you mentioned also, uh, also you are doing a survey, You what are you doing? Yeah, well, the, the point is that um, we are, Agri's AP is, I didn't mention that, and that this is probably the reason why I'm here in this CMI, is, is based on uh, DC principles, yeah? It's an application profile. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, so we want to, um, um, yeah, to, 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 to see um, how to improve that part, so uh, I, yeah um yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> there is one question from the audience yeah. uh, in terms of open data set what are the major challenges do the agreements have different options from marcia uh, is the question uh yeah so the agreement is yes or no so if you're referring to that so i thought you you are referring to that much so um we have people that they simply say, no, I don't want to participate. And other people that say they would like to. So if you mean that, but they have to, um, so they have to submit um, a form so that we are covered, um, um, legally speaking. Okay, so Marcia say thanks. But and coming back to your question about the search, the point is that at the moment with the website that we have, and with the situation of the data, we couldn't put a lot of filters. We couldn't use filters because uh, we didn't have um, any quality control about what types of documents. So who we didn't have any taxonomy to really encourage people to use type of document in a specific way, et cetera, et cetera. People were using different codes for the language. So either... Um, and the ISO 2, I, well, the, the two codes, um, three, three um, letters, code, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. plus other things that were very different as well, or even not even any code, but just the language. So this is happening with more, um, with more metadata. Now that we understand how we want to work on, with this is when we can really plan to improve this search um, mm -hmm. filters and search capabilities. And so to help to have a better experience um, searching in Angry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you to you. So I don't see any other questions. Nope.
example. In her last um, slide, uh, Inma put some contact information so people you can contact the the team. I I enjoy seeing the team also seeing uh, Peset there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank you for your presentation. Thank and you. Thank you, everybody that has been listening. We can now go to the next presenter. Let me change. Okay. One second. So, John, are you ready? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. So now we have John Antil, who works to the Department of Defense of Army. Tell me if I'm wrong. And something that I, I don't really know about, Army Expeditionary Civilian Workforce on Knowledge Manager. I didn't know that exists. And he has the master's in certified knowledge management for the Knowledge Management Institute and now the Master on Science in Knowledge Management from the Kent State. So I know you are a knowledge manager man, completely. And the title of the presentation is Sensors are, are Everywhere. It's your time, you know the time you have, and I hope uh, you enjoy it. I leave the 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 screen is your top. Thank you very much, ma'am. Again, my name is John Antill. I have recently transferred to this the Army Expeditionary Civilian Workforce. What they are is a group of government workers, Army, um, that get deployed around the world to help other organizations um, in areas that they're lacking. So for that, I'm going to begin my slideshow. So this is a high level overview that I give to general officers all the way down to um, colonels for information on how what we can do from a data perspective. So to get everybody on the same top part, of course, I'm going to have to go over the standards, and this is just for them to understand. It's just the common understanding is everybody knows it's not just one database we're working with. It's not just one metadata source we're working with. We're working with several of them. The biggest portion is that most of us are, most of our metadata descriptors are both going to be technical and operational. We go over and identify what a sensor is. Basically, it is a item that collects and sends data to somebody who can process it, which is turning data into knowledge and that knowledge into wisdom at the correct time for the correct person. These are all the type of sensors that most people are going to be used um, understanding alcohol sensors, touch sensors, gyroscopes, proximity sensors, the list goes on. Um, one that works very well is the soil moisture sensor. Uh, I've seen that used a lot in farming. And here's a bunch of other sensors that people don't understand. Geo uh, radio tagged elephants, radio tagged lemurs, and radio tagged cougars. What they have in common is that now we are starting to utilize that data to track and identify their movements. Once we can identify their movements, we can identify if a poacher or a large scale armed force is moving through there. And that's through Save the Elephants that started this. And they've been quite successful at bringing near real time data back to their rangers from this GPS data to the elephants that are tagged correctly. Volkswagen has covered multiple cars and multiple QR codes. 
what the, what I'm showing you here is basically every single thing has metadata. I don't care what it is. There's a metadata record on it. So this is showing how cheap sensors are starting to come down. These are going to be your average electronic sensors that report to a computer. Now, what I didn't mention on here was in February of 2021, now they're starting to use seismic sensors to warn villagers in Africa and in other elephant prone areas that the elephants are coming near them. So that was pretty cool. And that allows them to start placing up deterrence in place. Why do we need to care about sensors? It's not just that the sensors produce vital information and exchange data with other connected devices, but data brokers such as Experian trace your personal data, your debts, and give you a score that's used for lenders and marketing. So they're giving us a grade upon how we best do something. And that also goes and applies to all aspects of all aspects of life that if you have been caught jaywalking or play your music too loud, you might get a citizen score or a bad mark on your Experian credit report showing a late bill. The human has five basic sensors according to the world. I believe there's more. Um, we have 14 cent. What this is showing is the amount of sensors that start from our basic input to what we have generated through Google. These are numbers from 2018. So the human made sensors are going to be a little bit larger. And at any point in time, please ask questions. The use of sensors can be good or it can be bad. The good part is we can radio tra track animals. We can radio track our soldiers. We can track pretty much anything in the world through the use of metadata of the GPS. And then we can also have the bad aspect of it where you can identify information of an enemy movement size by looking at their radio frequency off foot. Yes, ma'am. Loyalty programs are also another way that we build up data. And the cool part is they you're thinking you're saving you some money, but in actuality, datas are now these loyalty programs are now being sold and brokered amongst the organizations. And this is all out in the open market. You, rewards members can save up to 70%. And Target can identify if you're pregnant, if you buy a uh, few of these 25 indicators that they have on their program. And by the way, that the Target ad that you think that's at your house is the same as your neighbors, you can guarantee it's going to be different based upon your shopping, shopping habits. So why I brought up all these different sensors and databases. I was part of a team that worked with the big data plate platform for the Army called Gabriel Nimbus. It's a system designed to store and virtualize large data sets. And we linked the tactical to the enterprise networks. It solves a lot of our problems, but what we had to first do was identify classifications for everything we had. We had to identify the metadata and normalize all the data sets. When you're talking over more than 150 data sets at one time, that's quite taxing. What we were able to do was have the developers that worked on these databases help us and use the made data tags so that we could input these into the Amazon warehouse. To continue with that program, it moves up and 
drops off data at different databases along the military uh, secured networks and picks up additional data. What's cool about it is that it also does the same exact reverse. It's able to parse the data that we've put in through the meta tags down to the cell level to drop off into the same databases so that what was created on a top secret network kit and it was unclassified can then be moved down to the unclassified network to help the soldiers. This also goes hand in hand with the program called Ike, which is used for cyber tracking um, operations. And what that allows us to do is to work with, again, all levels of classification so that the lowest common denominator can see what they're able to, to view based upon unclassed data or classified data. So if the data was collected on a top secret network, then they could see it on an unclassified network. What this does is it helps create more, so more software than ammunition. It's similar in the sense that some of these cyber kits are already preloaded with standard configurations and we could deploy out to different defensive or offensive platforms. We can also identify the number of soldiers, what their current training status is. We can identify whether they're on leave, all through different programs that has taken all these army databases and combined them into one common data set through the use of open source metadata tagging technology. If you have any questions about this or wish to continue the conversation, there is my contact information. Uh, thank you to Ms. Marsha, who was one of my teachers in doing the data organization for just-in-time delivery for working on this program. Do we have any questions? So thank you, John, for your presentation. and. Yeah, I would like to see some of this metadata. Would it be possible <laughs> from one of these more than 100 databases? So we're talking, you can actually see this at your own company. It's similar to what your HR department has, your factory level operations has, and say your information network, um, your information technology centers. If you try to combine all three of those networks, and those databases into a program that you would use, that's similar to what the Army's doing with all this cyber and all these sensors. It's giving them a broader picture and allowing them to identify stuff such as using earthquake sensors to track elephants um, to new technologies that could use light waves to track what you're doing. All the stuff that they're doing is through these open source data sets that people allow them access to for across the network. So um, it's kind of cool because you can actually plan out a soldier's training program during the life of their contract mm -hmm. and show them what their Im actual impact options are. Yeah, but uh, there is uh, any like a uh, standard for the metadata of, or each database is having its own metadata. That's, that's the biggest problem that we had was that they're all, all the databases have different metadata tagging schemes and we had to bring them all into one Amazon warehouse. And so we had to nominalize the data and we did choose DCMI, the uh, Dublin core, to identify IPs, telephone numbers, people, locations. So the back end work was the metadata. The, that was the easy part compared to identifying all the databases. Okay, thank you. There is another any question from the audience? I haven't seen nothing new. No? So 
in your last slide, you put your contact. So I'll share the slides to you um, as soon as we're get we're off the VTC, ma'am. Yeah, don't worry. So thank you, thank you for your presentation, John. Thank you, ma'am. So now we have the third one. Let me see. Let me share. I I just I was already sharing. <laughs> okay. So Washington or Luis or I don't know which one is the name you, you really use. <laughs> yes, uh, segundo uh, it's to simplify. <laughs> ah, okay. So segundo, the, the last thing. Okay. So segundo okay. is your turn. Thank you very much. Um, you are, this is the, your presentation, you are a technical coordinator of the area of treatment analysis and dissemination of scientific information at this EBICT Brazilian Institute. And I have seen that you have like several degrees, a doctorate, master degree in informatics and then mathematics, all of them from Brasilia. So, okay, impressive. Your, your presentation is about the use of Dublin Core in this ecosystem you are working with, Brazilian scientific information ecosystem. Whenever you want, I shut up and you present. So thank you very much. <clears throat> and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present some uh, some 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 um, context about the, the Brazilian uh, information ecosystem and also the metadata that we have used to to perform interoperability between the system the ecosystem <clears throat> that we have. Uh, I'm Washington Segundo from the Brazilian Institute of Information Science and Technology, and I will start uh, present my slides. Uh, so the the main uh, ecosystem that we have uh, nowadays is the Oasis BR, that is a network uh, that harvests um, information from different sources. Um, the the uh, more recently we start harvesting uh, metadata from data repositories. But we have a long history uh, harvesting uh, metadata from institutional repositories, um, scientific journals, and also uh, digital library of libraries of these dissertations. But Oasis BR itself is also a window to be um, harvested to uh, other initiatives uh, in Latin America and Europe and as in and the um, international context as well. Um, for example, BDTD, that is our national library of thesis and dissertations, is harvest, uh, harvested by the NDLTD, uh, that is the Network Digital Library of thesis and Dissertations. Uh, also, we have a partnership with Portugal, where uh, the, the equivalent system of Portugal, that is named HICAP, harvest uh, Oasis BR content, and we also uh, harvest HICAP content. So there is a, a, a kind of a, um, mirroring between these two systems. And also Oasis BR is, is a node of the La Referencia network. Uh, the La Referencia network, it's a, it's a, it's a group of uh, 12 countries. Um, mainly Latin American countries, but we also have um, Spain in this network and also a partnership with Portugal. Um, and uh, via La Referencia, we are harvested uh, by Open Air, that is the European Open Science Network. Uh, and it contains many, many, many countries of uh, Europe. Um, so this is just a, a, a map 
uh, of the three sources, the main three, the main three sources that we have uh, to OSBR. The head dots are the libraries of these dissertations. The green are the institutional repositories and the um, the the blue one, uh, blue one are the the um, electronic journals or electronic scientific electronic journals, and this is some numbers of ways BR. We are aggregating more than six hundred uh, organizations uh, with more than one thousand and three hundred SERS that um, aggregates approximately. Uh, 2 million and 670 records. Um, so we have uh, 110 IRs, institutional repositories, and this is the distribution of the, the, the number of sources in each category and the number of records in each category. This is the, the data repositories category. We, we have only eight data repositories, but we are growing uh, and we are creating only 340 data sets. But the, mainly, the main sources are in the institutional repositories and the electronic thesis dissertations databases. Uh, so we are strongly based on the OIP image, OIP image um, protocol. And this uses uh, the, the um, Dublin Core uh, metadata, but we also have some strategy to extend this um, restricted class of this uh, de metadata description. Uh, we are using uh, the La Referencia guidelines for description of the, the, the digital objects, but uh, these guidelines is uh, are based on the open air guidelines for publications, data repositories, and also for CRIS, uh, so for systems of type CRIS. Um, and we are also uh, building our, all, our own uh, CRIS, uh, national CRIS, uh, that involves many, many entities of the, the research ecosystem, not only the results, uh, that where Waze BR is, is focused, um, but also uh, research, the researches, the laboratory and equipment infrastructure, the funding, the research projects and the research organizations. Um, and the BR CRIS, that is the name of national uh, CRIS, uh, is based also in the La Referencia platform. La Referencia platform is used uh, for uh, building the, the OASIS BR uh, search uh, engine. And uh, La Referencia platform is extended, extended to allow uh, harvest not only um, repositories, journals, and um, uh, electronic thesis databases, but uh, also uh, CV platforms and also in the, any, any kind of uh, uh, research information platform. Uh, also, uh, for example, uh, research graphs are, are, are being harvested by La Referencia nowadays. And uh, the, we, we want to highlight the open air research graph uh, that's open for harvest uh, any kind of uh, object in this research graph. Uh, once we have the, the metadata, organized in, inside uh, La Referencia platform. It is uh, exported to search um, systems like Vivo uh, and also to dashboards uh, based on Kibana and Elasticsearch. Um, we have also um, a, a semantic data model uh, that is based on the Vivo uh, ontology but it is extended to our context uh, to aggregate some entities that is not uh, native in the Vivo ontology and, and also in standard vocabularies. 
uh, we, we have some map, mapped entities in this uh, ontology uh, that is, are exported to the Vivo uh, software. And um, this is what I, I want to, to, to tell to you. I, I, I'm, I, I was uh, prepared to, to talk just 10 minutes, but I can um, talk more about this. I think I have uh, uh, time to, to, to make just a demonstration about the Vivo uh, searching um, platform and also the dashboard, uh, dashboards that we have already uh, built uh, uh, about this infrastructure. And I don't know, uh, Gemma, if, if I have time yeah. to this. Yeah, yeah you, you have time. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was short indeed. Yeah. So maybe you can show some of the what I would say tripas, the insights of the okay. Vivo or whatever. Okay. Let me show it. Yes. Are you seeing my, my screen? Yeah. Or not? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is the Vivo instance. We have uh, this is in text, in, in, in not not in production yet, but it's also might, but is is already um, in, uh, in 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 tests, and uh, for example, we have um, two two uh, thousand and and a half uh, people uh, that we exported to this platform, um, and in vivo we can easily. Uh, as, as you know, uh, see information from the entities that we have aggregated. Uh, for example, here I have the, the, the publications of this author uh, and uh, some native uh, metrics of these publications. And also we can see the, the um, co-author, uh, co uh, author network uh, very easily and it is native uh, of, uh, from, from Vivo. Uh, we have also organizations uh, in this uh, exported to this. Uh, it's some, we, we created a, a new entity named community to, to separate some communities inside this uh, uh, test. Uh, we also, um, we are working now to, to create projects but Vivo is a, a very interesting uh, interface to, 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 to search uh, in graphs. Um, like just show another thing about Vivo that I, I, was, I, I was very surprised that it's not native from, from the software. For example, the, the, map, uh, the map of science um, is, is also very uh, easy to, to, to dig out and um, we, we know we we are working with uh, health uh, health uh, researchers so and now we can uh, see it and confirm it because this research is uh, is, is the, the biology area infectious disease area and also in other uh, areas uh, around it and uh, the dashboards uh, is are in this other uh, platform that it's Kibana. It's also very um, uh, plastic to 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 configure it, and 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 not it's not difficult to do the, it. Yes. Uh, so for journals, uh, we have uh, this this dashboard that you have exported automatically from from the Life Science platform. And we can see the, the research areas of these journals, the, the languages, and it, also the H5 uh, index of these journals. And this is uh, Brazilian journals, electronic journals, um, that we are testing some, some aggregations. Um, and also you have, for example, the thesis and dissertations uh, of Brazil in the, the, the period of what, 1980. Uh, seven and in 2018, um, and this is uh, is the type of one million and and 
140 uh, theses. Um, and this is very, very uh, customizable and, and interactive. Uh, so we are in the, the process of testing and to, to, to put it out uh, in November or December um to the community brazilian community also the the international community but we are we're very satisfied with the the results we, we achieved uh with this approach of aggregating uh everything in the the life platform and exporting it to vivo and to Elasticsearch to be visualized in the kibana uh, dashboards so that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry for my English is very, very bad, but I, 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 I don't know if I, I was uh, compressive. No, it was clear. It was clear. Okay. So, yeah, there is no other questions from the audience, but my question is for each of these elements, like the area of conocimiento, thesis or universities, do you keep metadata related to Dublin Core, or you have already made the translation and everything, and it doesn't exist yeah. anymore. Yeah, we are using a schema based on in Dublin Core, but mm -hmm. we need to map it to the okay. triplets the in the, the, the Vivo ontology. And okay. here we are also using uh, the Dublin Core uh, schema because we have something like Bibo on uh, the Bibo ontology, and also Dublin Core is strongly using on it. Uh, another part that you use it, uh, Dublin Core is in the description of the research data because we, we are using the data set, data site schema and also it uses some, some parts of Dublin Core. So I think the Dublin Core is the base of the, the, the mainly the, the, the publications and the research data uh, um, description. Okay. Okay, so thanks. So, okay. thank you. Any other question or suggestion? So yeah, thank you. I'll not say thanks. Okay. So, thanks, Segundo. And then we can go to the last presentation. Okay. Let me see. One second. So now it's the, the turn of Isabel Martin Tirado. Are you there? I am. Okay. She is working in a, for DGBs, a company here for very, very interesting software for libraries, archives, and so on. She works for the information science department or Departamento de Documentación. You may say very better than me. And you are going to present about the work of an, Dublin Core for digital libraries from this DigiBip. It's one of the one of the the products of DigiBis. Okay, so I close my session. Let me see. And it's your turn. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you, Yemma, for the presentation. Um, yeah, I work at the Documentation and Innovation Department of DGBs. Um, let me share the screen. Um, okay. So, um, Well, uh, I'll be talking about the DGB, which, as uh, Gemma said, it's one of our products. Um, the name stands for DG Digital DGBs, which is the name of the company, and BIP stands for Biblioteca uh, Library. Can you see my screen? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, to start with, I would like to, to make a brief introduction to the company. Um, the company was created by the La Ramendi Foundation, uh, which, has, uh, which had the aim of uh, spread the cultural heritage. 
And um, to do so, uh, the foundation decided to create the company. So uh, we have two main networking areas at DGVs. Uh, one is the digitization of the cultural heritage, and the other one is the development of our own uh, softwares for digital libraries, archives, and museums. At the beginning, the company was uh, it was created at the late 90s, so the digitization of the documents and books, as you can imagine, uh, it was kept in CDs and DVDs. Uh, but uh, internet uh, grows so fast, and uh, of course the technologies that uh, there was a, a, a necessity, a need of uh, the soft, our software to organize and to show and share those digitizations. So um, if we want to share and it's something digital nowadays, the most important maybe are the metadata. And to share those metadata, we need a repository. Uh, DGV works with an OAI PMH repository that works obviously with Amico. Nowadays, uh, we are present in more than 50 institu institutions um, public as well as private. And um, well, uh, we can be proud to say that um, we have been hand in hand uh, with metadata from the very beginning uh, because uh, already in 1995, when the first encounter about metadata took place in Dublin, our colleague Xavier Genko attended this meeting. Um, well, um, of course, uh, the Dublin Core development advanced. For example, in 2004, a Dublin Core library application profile was published. Um, and little by little, many new uh, metadata based on Dublin Core were created. Um, for us, and especially for DGV, the most important maybe is the Europeana, the, the European uh, Digital Library, um, because uh, the clients, our customers using DGV uh, are present in that uh, library. So any changes, any improvement that Europeana asked for, we need to, to develop and uh, we effort to do so. Uh, for example, in 2008, Europeana began their, their own way of metadata with the creation of ESI, Europeana Semantic Elements, which uh, is based on the qualified Dublin Core, to which, of course, new elements were added. But unfortunately, Europeana noticed very soon that it wasn't enough for the semantic web. So two years later, uh, Europeana uh, created, started creating the Europeana data model, EDM, which is much more flexible and expressive than EC. Um, it is built on Dublin Core 2, but also on SCOS and RDA standards, and uh, it is based on semantic web and linked data. Um, Europeana has, uh, has been going on developing uh, improvements and asking for new requirements. And uh, as uh, we want to, to approach them, um, for example, in 2019, um, Europeana publishing guide, uh, Solides, uh, this guide brought news like the establishment of tiers that support the, the two posts. Uh, the improvement of quality images and the improvement of quality metadata. For example, uh, the importance given to the language of the data. Um, we saw in Masubrat talking about the importance of the language. Well, Europeana uh, is also asking to, to show the, the language. So we have to, to improve our, our software to, to make it better, of course. <laughs> Um, so um, we've seen, uh, we've talked about metadata. Um, the program DGB um, is immersed in linked open data technology, and uh, it works as easy 
as the cataloger, just fill the record in Mark uh, 21. And the program itself, the application, transform or pass dynamically and transparently those data into uh, other formats. For the repository, uh, it transformed the data into Dublin Core, but we, the program also uh, transforms to uh, METS, Europeana Data Model, and RDF. And um, this transformation works not only for the, for the bibliographic records, but also for holdings and authorities records. And um, well, such a comfortable, so to say, um, tool, um, it would be unseen not to keep it updated. So DGB holds uh, the effort to keep the DGB and uh, other applications updated to last versions of standards. Uh, in this case, uh, DGB is updated to the version 31 of Mark 21, which was the, the last version available at the moment of its closure. And um, it's also remarkable to say that um, DGB uh, codifies value vocabularies uh, on bibliographic and uh, authority records, uh, following the spirit of last uh, W3C LLD final inform and semantic enrichment. This means that records can be uh, semantically enriched by the cataloger. Um, we're talking about this uh, program for libraries, but just for you to know, we also uh, develop other softwares for archives and museums called uh, DigiArc and DigiMoose, and uh, they work equally, turning the, um, the metadata uh, from EAD3 in archives and LIDO in museums uh, to Dublin Core for the repositories the software has. We also offer um, a Digi Hub, which is an aggregator. Um, just taking advantage of the possibilities of Dublin Core repositories, Digi Hub uh, harvests uh, other uh, Dublin Core repositories and show, the, show them. Um, examples here in Spain is uh, Hispana, um, maintained by the Minister of Culture. Uh, or American Eye or Galiciana. So, um, as I said at the beginning, um, DigiBiz was created by Lara Mendy Foundation. And um, to follow that aim of uh, sharing and spreading uh, cultural heritage, uh, the foundation also has uh, its own uh, li digital library, which is called Polymath Virtual Library. And um, of course, uh, this library uh, is provided uh, with all the news of DigiBiz, is uh, based on this software. And uh, has, it has been, and it will go on being the best set of the application since the beginning. Um, this uh, Polymath Virtual Library um, accomplishes all these standards and uh, because of that, it has been use case twice by W3C and by Europeana. But uh, well, this all was very theoretical. So let's see some examples. Um, okay, wait a moment. I need to share another screen. Okay, um, so um, this Polymath Virtual Library um, have created uh, this year a new library, um, virtual library, which is called Heritage Hubs Virtual Library. Um, it shares, um, okay, sorry. Um, uh, it shares the result of, um, it shares a group of videos um, that uh, youngsters of different European participating countries were asked to, to film in order to show their own traditions. And um, 
one of those records uh, is this one we have here, the intercambio, the exchange. Uh, so to show you how easily the program works, uh, well, the cataloger obviously um, filled in the, the record in Mark 21. Here we have um, the file view. Um, the Mark tag would be this one, the view. Um, just change. Um, Mark XML, for example. And um, just to see, sorry. It's easier to see here. Dublin Core. Just with two clicks, we can see the same uh, record in a, in a different format. Um, how is this uh, record seen in the OAI PMH repository? Um, sorry. This is the same record in the repository of the Polymer Virtual Library of this record. Um, another example, this would be an authority example of uh, Majansi Siskar, which, we, which was a philosopher and historiker. Um, it's just the same. We have, a, it's a very huge uh, record. Uh, but just with two clicks, we can uh, see it in another format. Uh, we could also export it. I'm not showing it here because of the sharing uh, screen thing, but we can see it. This is the, the same record of this uh, authority in the repository. Um, the Polymer Virtual Library has two repositories. It has one for bibliographic and another for authorities records. But anyway, uh, this would be this long, huge <laughs> authority record. Um, another example could be um, a subject uh, authority. Okay, um, this is on the virtual library. Uh, one of the of those that have of the two that have the culture minister. Um, well, as you see, it's it's just the same. It works just the same. The file view, um, the mark tag view. We could see it also in mark XML, and uh, we could also export the the record in in EDM, for example, OK? Uh, another example, um, I talked before about authority records and bibliographic records. Um, DGB works with, um, with records for holdings, which not every um, application uses. But we do. Uh, it would be the the record for the holding itself. Okay. And um, well, turning back to the presentation. Um, yeah. So, what's the the future for our? Um, DGB program. Um, well, uh, DGBs uh, and also the, the Lara Mendy Foundation consider to follow the way of the semantic web according to schema org and big frame ontologies, just as Dublin Core was once created from Mark. Um, we are supporting and developing an IDI project focused on the conversion of Mark 21 format into schema, big frame, and uh, 3IF the same way as it does now, dynamically and transparently from the, the same way it does to, from Darling Core to European data model, for example. And um, in this uh, way, um, two years ago, uh, Minister of Industry and INOR certified an innovation project of our company that also worked uh, on this transform transformation from Mark into BigFrame. And uh, well, this was all 
<laughs> Thanks very much for your attention. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, if you wish to, to have more information, you can find us at digivis.com and laramendi.es. Okay. Thank you, Isabel. If there is no other question from the audience, I think we can we can finish. Yeah. And Tom, are you okay? Do you think it's fine? We are very, very on time. So again, I repeat, thank you everybody because you have followed the, the, the instructions. And I'm going to say goodbye. So Marcia said, thank you all. I also say, say thank you all.